Welcome to this video in the Blueprint of Life topic. This video is going to be looking at the dot point, identify how the following current reproductive techniques may alter the genetic composition of a population. So it's quite a straightforward dot point being it's identifying the different reproductive techniques. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at what uh, reproductive techniques entail overall. Then we're going to have a look at these three in particular and the advantages and the disadvantages that they have in particular with altering the genetic composition of a population. So selective breeding or artificial selection has been around since people began growing crops and domesticating animals. Basically what we mean by reproductive techniques is the selection of desirable characteristics before the breeding process takes place. So being able to identify a particular male and a particular female that have characteristics that you wish to reproduce and then forcibly creating a reproductive relationship between those two organisms. So this has, had, this has led humans to changing the genetic composition of herds and crops over thousands of thousands of years. And as we can see from the diagram here, we now have many, many different ranges of dogs or many different breeds of dogs because of this selective breeding. We see this all the time with the introduction of new sort of uh, boutique breeds of dogs that are coming out all the time. So starting off with our first of the reproductive techniques being artificial insemination. This is uh, a situation used in agriculture where we have the injection of male semen into the vagina or cervix of the female without the two organisms actually undergoing the process of sexual intercourse. So the sperm is collected from the stud male. So the stud male is the male that shows those really dominant characteristics that uh, people wish to pass on. And it can be stored, frozen or sent anywhere. So it obviously has that advantage that we'll have a look at in a second in a bit more detail. In agriculture, it's mostly used in animals such as sheep, cattle and pigs. And some of the desired features that uh, people try to reproduce is animals that will produce more beef, uh, cows that will produce higher milk production, milk with a higher butterfat content because apparently that tastes better, sheep with finer wool that's obviously able to be sold at a much, sold at a much higher cost, and pigs with leaner meat in order to produce those things like bacon and ham that have a lot uh, less fat content. So an example of this is the Frisian variety of male cows breeding with a Jersey cow. And what happens is the offspring produce large amounts of creamy milk. And the second example is sheep with finer wool and pigs with more lean meat. So that just sort of just goes back and has a look at the desired features. But that first example there of the Frisian male cow with a Jersey cow to produce large amounts of creamy milk is a great example. So some advantages of artificial insemination means that the male may provide sperm for many females without leaving the paddock. So obviously uh, we can have a male, one male, and then in a farm and a multitude of females. And that one male is able to reproduce with all of those females without having to go through the process of sexual reproduction all the time reduces the danger of injury in particular to the female because as we know in most species the males are stronger and more dominant than the females. It increases the breeding life of the male again because it takes away that need for exerting energy during the process of uh, sexual reproduction and can obviously increase the numbers of endangered species because that one male is able to uh, inseminate or able to be used to create reproductive relationships amongst a number of females and therefore produce a larger number of offspring. Some disadvantages is in the beginning it relies on trial and error in order to find the traits that you actually want. So remember uh, Mendel did many many experiments to have his purebred plants before he actually started to do his experiments and this is what sort of happens here with artificial insemination. There's a potential for over-exaggerated features to continue in a population, which goes back to our looking at changing the genetic makeup of a population. It's important for farmers or agriculturalists to maintain detailed pedigrees of the animals that they are uh, creating, reproducing relationships with, as less favourable genes can also be passed on at the same time. So by keeping detailed pedigrees, they're able to see what characteristics are passed on from what uh, male to what offspring and therefore if there's an issue arising they're able to remove that male from the artificial insemination process. 
it's important to ensure that closely related animals are not interbred. So again, that comes back to the use of pedigrees and the overuse of spurred from one particular breed line can actually reduce, reduce genetic diversity. So as we've looked at uh, things like meiosis uh, crossing over variation amongst uh, the sperm and eggs that are produced helps to increase genetic diversity. But if you're consistently using the same male, you're possibly decreasing that genetic diversity. The next technique is artificial pollination, which we had a look at briefly when we looked at Mendel. And this involves humans taking the pollen from one plant and placing it onto the stigma of the other. So the pollen is taken from the plant with the characteristics that we want, and it is introduced to the stigma of another plant. This has been used to produce a wide range of fruits, vegetables, and cereal crops over time. So some of the desired features can include a higher yield, which means that we're producing greater crops, therefore obviously being able to provide more people with food. Larger fruit, again, goes back to providing people with larger, uh, larger amounts of food. And disease, drought, or frost resistant, meaning especially disease resistant, things like reducing pesticides, drought resistant, meaning that we can grow these plants in areas that they may not have been able to be grown in before. An example, pears grown in China have been hand pollinated since regional bees were wiped out by pesticides in the late in the 1980s. So this is actually a serious issue that we're facing at the moment, that bees have become a highly endangered species and that we may have this issue coming up in more places than just China because the number of bees that are in the wild has reduced quite considerably. Some advantages, obviously leads to plants that can be bred in climate that they're not usually suited to in controlled conditions. So therefore providing food to uh, people that live in areas that they may not have had this food before and able to produce resistant plants for countries with high incidence of drought, which ties in with that first stop point. Some disadvantages, overuse can lead to entire areas becoming susceptible to a specific pest. So this happened with the Irish potato famine because there was no real variation amongst the population of the potatoes that were being produced because of the way that they were being artificially pollinated. A fungal disease got into the plants and because they weren't able to deal with it, the whole population, almost the whole population got wiped out and therefore led to the biggest food source for the Irish people disappearing and therefore leading to famine. The plants gradually lose their vigour. So we had a look at vigour with uh, hybridisation. So they lose their ability to deal with these changing conditions. If we're growing more plants, we have obviously the uh, problem of overcrowding and then that ties in with that last top, dot point where there is a lack of nutrient, nutrients available for all individuals. Then we have cloning. So the creation of identical genetic copies of an original organism. It's mostly common amongst plant populations, but not among animals, simply due to the difficulty in actually cloning uh, any type of animal species. So reproductive cloning is performed when it's necessary to produce a whole offspring to survive, whereas therapeutic, therapeutic cloning sorry, is a creation of embryos to produce human stem cells to treat the disease, and then the embryo is actually killed in the process. So we may have heard a lot of controversy around therapeutic cloning in the past that people believe that once an embryo has been created through the fusion of the sperm and egg, that it is a living entity. Therefore, killing the embryo is in fact killing a life form. Advantages of cloning, it improves the breeds because the genetics are copied, uh, therefore with the most desired characteristics. And organisms that are difficult or slow to breed normally can be reproduced quickly by carrying out in the laboratory. So in the secondary source investigation, we have a look at a couple of different ways that cloning is carried out. And we can see that we don't need both organisms to be in the same location. It can be done in the lab and it can be done in quite a quick way. And lastly, some disadvantages about cloning obviously leads to a smaller gene pool because we're not having that variation. We're specifically picking exactly the genes that we want. Some LLs that may be of benefit in the future may be lost. So that comes back to our idea of natural selection, that we need variation in the population. And if that variation disappears and the environment changes, we therefore uh, lose those alleles and have the ability to adapt to the changes in the environment. Problems with interbreeding, with recessive genes showing traits, therefore loss in genetic variation. 
certain characteristics will dominate over others because they're the ones that are being reproduced. And as I mentioned earlier, ethical issues to consider such as stem cell research and the killing of embryos once they've been used to harvest their stem cells. So as we can see, each of the three techniques have their advantages in terms of increasing populations, uh, faster reproduction rates and things like that. However, we can also see that each of the three techniques also leads to a reduction in the possibility of variation occurring within the population, therefore leading to a possible loss of that ability to be able to adapt to a changing environment in the future. And that brings us to the end of this video. So thank you for watching.